Welcome to Wine Line Radio. This is your host, Robert Scott, and today we're speaking with Brian Duncan. Brian is a uh, food and wine expert, and uh, central uh, to his expertise is the wine, food, uh, restaurant business, and hospitality. Brian, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm absolutely terrific. One of the uh, most beautiful days I've seen in Chicago in 2018 so far. Oh, it must be uh, like 16 degrees then. (laughs) I think we're going to hit 50 today. Wow. It's not much different than us here in Florida. Oh, good, good. So tell me, uh, uh, what is the uh, current and future uh, state, if you want to call it that, of the uh, restaurant business today and in the future? Well, nationally, uh, what I've been seeing uh, for some time, uh, I stepped away from my restaurant uh, in the winter of 2014, and it's given me an incredible perspective. Um, You know, in the restaurant industry, uh, we have, um, we're almost inherent uh, not truthful uh, in, in our ways of operating uh, to make our guests feel comfortable. A lot of times uh, we find that we, we make things look easy when they're difficult. Uh, the customer should never know if there's a problem. And since I've been outside of uh, the running of day-to-day restaurants, uh, I've noticed that there was, um, there was kind of an apocalypse coming. Uh, in the Chicago market, it's, uh, it, it's been oversaturated with too many restaurants uh, for a number, maybe about eight to ten years now. And that bubble has uh, already bur- begun to burst, and it's not over. Uh, but that's, that's something that's happening nationally. Uh, there, there are too many restaurants. Uh, the second level of that sort of um, Jenga game that's starting to topple is that um, the uh, social media has changed the landscape. So now it's a, from the consumer uh, and guest standpoint and the uh, food critics, it's a race to see who can get to the restaurants first, the hottest new restaurant. And it's become like a, ch- a checking off on the bedpost, been there, done that. And the result of that, the unfortunate result of that is that you don't have to go to a restaurant more than once. And yeah, you don't have any uh, reason to, uh, to develop favorites. Exactly. You, as a matter of fact, um, what I've been seeing, which is really frightening, is I've seen uh, one, two, and three-star Michelin restaurants. Some, some of these restaurants closing uh, within a couple of years of getting either that kind of uh, recognition and um, we've had several restaurants, uh, uh, a restaurant that took two years to open uh, recently, finally got open and was only open nine months. So it's, the landscape has changed. Uh, you certainly need to um, visit a restaurant more frequently to uh, give it longevity. But that's not even sexy anymore. Uh, the food critics are battling being up against social media. So the consumer was making it to these hot new restaurants before they were, and they had to change their calendar. Uh, They're probably going in and reviewing restaurants too soon, and so restaurants aren't really getting an opportunity to get on their legs and uh, get steady. Um, So it's it's kind of a cauldron of um, variables that aren't really helpful to the health uh, and longevity of the restaurant industry. The other problem that uh, you throw something else in the mix uh, chefs have been complaining for some time about the lack of talent um, and workforce. Uh, they're, I mean, they're, they're bouncing around. Then you add in the um, argument nationwide about uh, the, the minimum wage and raising the minimum wage. Uh, and <laughs> you be careful what you ask for. Uh, I remember seeing um, a series of protests here in Chicago uh, fast food uh, employees wanting at $15 an hour and coming through the uh, metro train station, the, uh, the commuter rails, and seeing almost instantly kiosks, robotic kiosks go up. 
and replacing employees. So if anybody thinks that the fast food industry is sitting around waiting for uh, the ax to fall um, and cause them to dig into their pockets deeper, uh, they were wrong. They had been planning all along. Um, so I, I, there's a lot there's a lot of meat here today to talk about because yeah. it's not just the restaurant industry. If you think about the uh, predictions of driverless cars, uh, that would that would uh, immediately wipe out taxis and Uber, uh, which also means that it could eventually wipe out truckers for moving products across the country. Um, so how are those jobs? Uh, where, you know, where are people going to go uh, who have been you know skilled for that type of labor? Um, we're in an evolutionary process. Uh, labor-wise, uh, because a lot of activity and a lot of jobs that we've taken for granted are being replaced right under, you know, right before our very eyes. And um, what I, rather than sort of have a doom and gloom, uh, ap apocalyptic uh, uh, vision or even conversation about it, what I would rather do is think about this is an opportunity for innovation. And it's an opportunity for reshaping the restaurant model, which is really broken. And, you know, we can dig into that as deeply as you want. But I, I much prefer looking for the what next and what kind of solutions and helping shape that in a way that um, answers questions that robots will never be able to. And that's that's about humanity. Well, Brian, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I don't think anywhere... Uh, is what you've been talking about more evident than right here in Central Florida. Uh, you know, we have uh, an enormous hospitality business here because of the theme parks, mm -hmm. and we have been absolutely, absolutely exploding with new restaurants uh, from one area of Central Florida to the uh, next. And, you know, what happens seems to me, when you open a new restaurant and you run up into that phenomenon where people are dashing to, uh, to uh, come try you uh, for one or two times, then you lose that commitment on the part of the restaurateur to bring them back and try to do things that uh, will build the longevity of the restaurant. Certainly, certainly. You know, I, I read a, uh, an article two days ago about um, a restaurant in Venice, Italy. Uh, some travelers uh, went to the police station at the end of their meal to uh, report that they had been gouged at a restaurant. I think it was something like 900 euros for three or four people for lunch and uh, the hidden charges and all of those kinds of things. Uh, you know, it's interesting to me that uh, I used to have uh, fantasies of being a food critic one day, a restaurant critic, and my uh, my specialty would be that I would never um, write a bad review. Uh -huh. The only reviews that I would write were uh, to restaurants that were really getting it right, that, that were really doing well, instead of being sort of tabloid-esque. Uh, if you read some reviews, you start to think, boy, they just really like being nasty or uh, it takes on a tabloid-esque uh, tone uh, for, uh, for readers. But I would be much more interested in reading reviews that they didn't waste their time beating, beating up a bad restaurant, but instead, of, instead of celebrating real talent and folded into that would be restaurants that were continuing to uh, produce great product and a great experience and understood hospitality at a very core uh, core center of their their being. So to me, it's almost like we we, we, we go about it the wrong way. Um, we're rewarding places by even mentioning them uh, in some cases, uh, but wouldn't it be great if you just opened up the book and this was a list of restaurants that uh, new and that have been around for a while that are still worth visiting. Yeah, you know, I try to do exactly that thing uh, 
same kind of format when I'm reviewing restaurants and wineries. If mm-hmm. if I'm not impressed or I don't think they're doing a great job, I just don't talk about them. Exactly. So, you know, it's <laughs> it just because they'll die on their own without me saying anything. But there are those that just completely stand out. There's one restaurant here in Central Florida that I've been associated with for almost 40 years since they opened their door. And it's called Enzo's on the lake, and it's a a beautiful uh, lakefront setting uh, here in Winter Park and an old kind of villa. Uh, And people just absolutely go back there time and time and Mm -hmm. time again. It's one of those restaurants when you go for uh, a nice dinner, you look around and you see... You see people there that uh, you've seen 10, 15, 20 times. So mm-hmm. those are really rare these days. The loyalty. Yes, it is. It is. And why aren't we celebrating, you know, really celebrating those? Uh, there's so many places that uh, continue because they weren't social media, uh, uh, you know, I don't even know the word, social media mavens. Uh, they almost eliminate themselves from uh, being sort of visible and in, in the presence of mind in people's uh, a list of places to must must go see. And it's almost as though the critics are really uh, encouraging that because they don't celebrate the ones who have been open 5, 10, 15, 20 plus years um, that deserve uh, to be mentioned. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the awards circuit. Uh, I know that the James Beard Foundation uh, honors classic restaurants, which is a great thing. And that's a that's a, a hat tip to uh, places that have been around. But in general, in the local, uh, in city uh, metropolitan areas, it, it's always got to be about what's, what's new, what's hot, and uh, so forth. Um, but that's where we are. Well, in a way, that's a shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I, again, I say it's an opportunity. If I if I uh, get a few extra hours in a week, maybe that's maybe I should start my own. Well, you know, it's it's what you're talking about is is vital to the business too today. Even though you know it's this explosion of uh, social media, uh, if you're not adept at using social media, then people just don't know about you. They don't read newspapers much anymore. Nobody. Nobody does. And you don't get uh, really good reviews on television and that type of thing. So it's the social media. And we found that out with Go Wide. Yes, you know, exactly. uh, If we're not tweeting, people don't know about us. That's right. So that's right. in a way, that's from a marketing standpoint, it's good that you learn these uh, things and you use the tools that are available to you. On the other hand, it's a shame that uh, that we don't celebrate those uh, restaurants and uh, wineries that have been doing a good job. It's you know, yeah, a great well, example it of that it is drives our conversation. I think to how um, tethered to our devices uh, we have become, whether we we want to admit it or not. Um, I saw something that was real, that uh, was probably one of the more exciting things I've run across in the last year. Have you seen these? Uh, we've done it. Uh, we've done articles about it in uh, Go Wine uh, about augmented reality. Where yes. the wine, yes. So the wine labels uh, come to life uh, when you have an app. You go in the store, and uh, 19 Crimes uh, is probably the the best one I think is as an example. And it gives you the background, the story behind uh, each person that's on the label, uh, which is it's, it's really it's really uh, fascinating. But what immediately popped up in my mind was not only the, the applications for the retail shopper uh, for wine, but almost any product you could possibly think of. Can you imagine that at a supermarket when I when I'm in a, a wine shop and I see. Um, I'm near the University of Chicago, and I have a, a, a retail client in that neighborhood. And I immediately, when the students come in, the first thing that comes out is the phone, and they, they're Googling this wine or they're using some other wine-centric app. Um, 
the uh, applications for that outside of wine into food and into almost any other product um, are endless. Uh, you know, I think it has restaurant applications. Um, oh, I do too. You know, there are uh, there there are plenty of other opportunities that I th I think are there. It's in some ways it's, it saddens me a little bit uh, because the wine industry, the retail industry, has not changed much. Uh, you have mom and pop shops where you can get to know the owner uh, or uh, the staff there, and they begin to know your preferences, very similar to the person that uh, cuts your hair or, uh, or fixes your car. They kind of know something about you. And I love that. I love that humanity, that, that uh, interaction that I think, don't think a, a robot will ever be able to replace. But what I do know is uh, you can actually um, benefit uh, you, if you've gone into some of those shops, they have shelf talkers. Sometimes they're handwritten. Sometimes they're produced by the winery. Um, and I'm sure the scores have done their job to at least uh, entice people to, uh, to pick up a bottle or two. But um, this augmentation, uh, we're just scratching the surface there, uh, this augmented reality. And um, I think that there are going to be some exciting things come out. That's another one of my predictions that is going to uh, move over into some other uh, product lines. It just it kind of reminds me of the Jetsons. Yes, it really does. <laughs> you'll you'll float really... around in your driverless car and uh, you'll uh, come into your local wine shop and uh, all of a sudden floating before you will be information about a particular wine which will entice you to buy it, take it home and try it. You may hate it, but... Uh, on the other hand, you may find something that uh, you really like. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have to face it. Uh, the uh, it's not a, 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 a you know the millennial uh, generation, and I don't want to beat up on them, but they're much more comfortable uh, interacting on their phones than they are uh, person to person. And uh, while I would like to see us do better at human to human uh, interaction. Um, the, the, I, that train's left the station. It's not going away. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping that we're wise in figuring out what areas uh, are always going to need humanity. It's interesting to me when you go to a restaurant, uh, I'm always uh, disappointed if you approach the host stand. Um, instead, of, uh, instead of saying hello, sometimes they'll say how many as before even saying right. Good evening or good afternoon, and that's that's automated. That's kind of an automated, disconnected, machine-like um, uh, greeting, if you will. Uh, when sometimes when I'm out in uh, the public doing events and tastings, uh, quite often people will approach the the wine table, and I say, "How are you?" and they say, "Red." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're red. Yeah, you're absolutely well, right. You don't look red to me, but we'll start there. And uh, but you know civility. Um, so it, it, it back to sort of my um, my core uh, uh, commitment to hospitality is that when we you and I sit across the table from one another at a meal or share coffee or something like that, that human interaction that's the the most civil thing that we do together. The breaking bread uh, together as, as human beings. Um, when we begin to turn that into mechanical, it's almost like back to the days of the um, automats. Um, right. And some of those are beginning to pop up across the country. Um, what, what, is the, what is the restaurant experience going to be like? Is it going to be the choice between very, very high-end, uh, expensive um, food, wine, uh, artistry, uh, circus tree, circus tree, that's not a word, circus tree. Uh, it is now. <laughs> yeah. Um, experiences that, you know, a cost, and, a, and, a, and they come at a high cost. And then um, at the entry level where now we see food halls um, popping up everywhere, um, which is kind of the answer to uh, fast casual. There's a, there's a very successful one here in Chicago uh, it's in the center of the business district, and it's doing really, really well. They grouped together a bunch of 
very independent, um, real restaurant uh, concepts under one roof. And uh, it, it, it allows the, uh, the visitors quite a bit of choice and the uh, operators share a lot of the costs because that's what we're really talking about. The independents can't afford to be in the, the central business districts, uh, in the downtown uh, areas, because of the uh, the leases are so the, are so high. It's a real estate issue. That's one of the reasons the neighborhoods in Chicago, the restaurants in neighborhoods, are so much um, are, are, are prolific. Um, so it's, there's there's so many layers to this cake in terms of the variables that are changing and causing an evolutionary change and how we're going to be dining, you know, in the very now and into the near future. Um, yeah, you know, that's kind of what you're talking about. It's kind of what uh, Italy has done. Uh, yeah. You know, they, uh, they n not only offer shopping, but they offer a number of different uh, restaurant venues within the shopping experience. And we're starting to see that here in Central Florida with independent restaurants who not only are serving food, but they're allowing you to purchase their dinnerware, purchase mm -hmm. uh, uh, their flatware. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it becomes a marketplace. Yeah, it's uh, it becomes like a hybrid. My um, my uh, restaurant concept uh, that I had been thirty six was uh, I, I did a fusion uh, with a wine bar, a restaurant and a market. We served 50 uh, wines by the glass, and every single one of those wines were available at retail, along with food products, cookbooks, um, and different kind of uh, gift, wine gift paraphernalia. And uh, we can, you know, it's, 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 it's fun to see things that evolve uh, into uh, something else that makes it more productive. Um, I like uh, ingenuity, and I like well-thought-out concepts. And I do believe that this is uh, all of the shakeup in the restaurant industry on so many levels um, is a call for looking looking at it in a, from a different angle. And uh, look, you know who's done a better job of it uh, than sort of the restaurant industry has been the uh, the supermarkets. Uh, oh, yes. There's who have re rethought uh, what people are trying to do. So our larger uh, players here. In Chicago, the Whole Foods, the Marianos, and places like that have created these amazing environments where the draws are things like free parking. <laughs> in Chicago, <laughs> park one of the biggest corrupt, uh, most expensive uh, uh, problems for consumers. Uh, anybody visiting Chicago that's going to to go shopping, do retail shopping in the down Michigan Avenue, is going to pay you know twenty five, thirty, forty dollars. Just for a couple of hours parking in a mall. Uh -huh. That's a lot of money. You know, we have meters, uh, street meters that are as high as $6 or more an hour. Wow. So uh, driving is discouraged. Um, but when you have a supermarket where you can park all day, um, and then once you get inside, even if you don't want to shop right away, they have huge rooms where you can plug your phone in. Then who knew that uh, being able to charge your phone would be as big of a draw as, as it is. But a lot of us are not going to work in an office anymore and can uh, plug in wherever there's a plug-in. Right. And the, uh, they, the, they figured it out. Yeah, the, the Whole Foods here uh, has a full bar, uh, mm. primarily a wine bar, but you can go shop and uh, pick, out, you know, pick out a steak, uh, pick out a uh, uh, slice of tuna, and... Yep. Take it over, and they'll cook it for you. And they have a, they'll have a uh, lovely uh, private uh, place to sit down and enjoy a meal. So not only can you pack your car, pull the wine off the shelf, yeah, and not have to pay you know full uh, markup. You can invite your friends over uh, from the neighborhood, so you don't even have to get back in your car to go someplace else. No one's going to say uh, how many are in your party, or do you have a reservation? Uh, they're just gonna, you're just going to sit out and uh, treat it the way, have the experience that you want. Um, and it's a lot less hassle. You don't have to dress up if you don't feel like it. Um, probably some of them should do a little better than they're doing. But Absolutely. 
I've been in the, there's a, there's a huge uh, Whole Foods uh, and uh, Mariano's here uh, where I've seen it. I've been demoing, uh, doing wine tastings in the middle of the day. And it was two and three deep at the bar on a Tuesday and a Wednesday. It's amazing. So, so things are out. Things are changing. Some of the things are changing for the better. Some of the things are changing for the worse. Uh, yeah. The Orlando Sentinel we have, which is owned uh, uh, by the Tribune Company, uh, which you're well aware of, has a daily little section in the uh, in the kind of uh, society section called uh, "Ticked Off," and I was reading one this morning. Somebody was saying. When I go to a restaurant and the server comes up and begins their spiel about specials and everything, wouldn't it be nice if they made eye contact with you? Mm. Mm. There's the humanity. It is, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's, a, that's a very, very um, powerful uh, statement because um, the civility thing the hospitality, you know, greeting another person is is almost a rarity. People still want to start in the middle of the conversation. I remember years ago, prior to ever going to Europe, uh, being uh, hearing the horror stories uh, about how Americans were mistreated and how uh, mean the French were to travelers and to tourists. And I uh, got to go and visit Paris on numerous occasions. And my experiences were quite the opposite. Uh, one of the things that I did prior to leaving the, the first time, I uh, speak Spanish, but um, spoke less French. So I learned as many of uh, greetings and salutations as I possibly could. And, and, and the nice, niceties, uh, good morning, you know, thank you. Um, uh, how are you today? Uh, forgive me, um, I don't speak French. Um, maybe speak English and things like that. And what I found out was the ugly American was that person that walked into the stores saying, where's the Eiffel Tower? Right, exactly. Turning people, t trying to turn people into their instant information booth without any acknowledgement of, of someone else's humanity. And that's what they resented about. That's where the term ugly American really came from. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's happens here in our own country uh, with one another that people... Um, for some reason, uh, don't feel obligated to at least greet you with good morning, good afternoon, hi, how are you? I was wondering if you could help me. Any of those things, uh, you know, and it's, you know, I have people come to my wine table and say, what do you got? Yeah, yeah, you know, a, a simple buongiorno. Uh, <laughs> how are changes, you? It changes the conversation. Certainly it does. And, you know, the Europeans will treat you like friends uh, if you give them. But you really need to make the first step. You need That's to, right. Yeah, because you're the visitor. You, right. you need to say hello. You need to greet them. You, uh, you need to uh, tell them that uh, it's a wonderful day. And it just, yep. and all of a sudden, uh, it's like uh, you're a long-lost friend. Or is, uh, I, I had uh, magical experiences. One of the things that was, was really shocking to me was when I would use uh, when I would speak and uh, greet them, uh, and then I would I would caveat to uh, or pivot to um, I'm sorry I don't speak French or maybe speak English, and then they would answer me back again in French, saying your your French is very good, and, it's, I, and I would have to explain to them, well that was the extent. This is as far as I can go, but I, there were people who in shops would, I had one woman actually leave her shop and bring um, a neighboring, um, uh, her neighbor retailer in, who did speak English to help interpret for me. And I found that they were incredibly accommodating, uh, but well, you are right. It was because the effort was being made uh, and being respectful that I didn't assume that they spoke English when I didn't treat them as though that they were solely there, put on the face of the earth to uh, be at my beck and call. Yeah, a good example of that is, you know, I don't know what it's been now, 12, 13 years. Uh, when I first uh, met uh, 
the Checky family, Andrea Checky and uh, uh, Cesare, his uh, brother. And we developed a friendship over, you know, several uh, visits. And at one point, you know, we used to, I used to go visit the winery uh, with my wife and we would have lunch or, you know, just uh, taste some wines and that. That was fine. And uh, then one time they said, come on, we're going to go to Villa Cherna, which is the family home for for a dinner. And uh, we want you to come enjoy it. Mother will be there, so forth and so on. And upon leaving after that wonderful experience, uh, Andrea said, Robert, you used to be friends, but now you're family. Mm. And it just meant so much. And the reason that came to my mind, I just popped up on uh, my uh, desktop here uh, the uh, Checky uh, newsletter from Familia Checky. And this is their 125th year, which mm. is really uh, for Italian wineries is uh, uh, kind of new. Uh, but the thing that has amazed me ever since I've known them, uh, known them is that they continue to try to get better and better with the products they have. They expand their line. But the quality of their wines has risen 50, 60, 70 percent. And mm -hmm. Andrea tells me the last time we talked that what we're trying to do is go deeper and deeper and deeper into the product so that people really appreciate what the family is trying to bring them. And, you know, that attitude is uh, pervasive through the wine industry, I think, with, with uh, people all over the world. Certainly, certainly. It's, um, it's really amazing when you think about the uh, legacy of some of these families who've been producing for uh, decades and then those for centuries, uh, with, they, they still own the land, they're stewards of the land. Uh, it's a shocking uh, statistic, but uh, it's predicted that in less than five years, more than 50% of the vineyard land in the United States will be uh, large corporations. Yeah. And uh, the, the problem with that, most people, um, unfamiliar with the market and what, what, what really goes on, don't realize that when that train leaves the station, it doesn't go back the other way. So uh, knowing uh, who owns the land, there's a perfect storm. Um, you know, there are a lot of, uh, of uh, baby boomers who are wanting to retire and the children are not wanting to pick up the mantle and uh, continue in the family business. So uh, they're easy pickings for uh, larger uh, wine companies or larger uh, corporate brands that want to acquire rather than create. So they can go and snatch up these properties and these, these pre-made or pre-established brands, and uh, that, then that's it. So uh, the personality not only... And the unique qualities behind some of these family-owned uh, brands, small independent producers, and even medium-sized, is that uh, once it gets swallowed up, um, the winemakers themselves, that legacy is lost, and the families no longer making their wine and putting their thumbprint, um, the accountants are making the wines. Um, yeah, and that's, and that's a sad thing. Yeah, so we're, they talked about globalization. Um, you know, we have uh, brands that are uh, created out of literally nothing um, all the time. And uh, it, it, it's, it's hard for someone who enjoys being table side or being, you know, talking, sharing stories about uh, the families that really built these products and built the legacy and why they're so special and rare. Um, uh, I don't like making up stories. <laughs> you yeah. know, I don't like it. creating creating these um, these these things that don't really have the kind of history and commitment to uh, just what you're talking about, passion. Um, and uh, so 
I cherish those those uh, relationships that I have, as, as I'm sure you do, uh, places that I can visit in different parts of the country and the world where they're still doing it every day. Their, their arms are deep into the soil um, as well as their hearts. Well, that's, a, I think, a good place to, uh, and a positive note on which to end today's uh, discussion. Uh, I want you to know that I really appreciate uh, your input and uh, uh, the fact that you're bringing so much uh, to Wineline Radio and to go-wine.com. Folks, look up uh, Brian Duncan on uh, go-wine.com and uh, learn a little bit more about him. Uh, I'm sure you'll be impressed with his resume and... uh, Who knows? You may even have an opportunity to get to meet him if you're in the uh, Chicago area or elsewhere. Ron, it was such a pleasure to hear your voice again today, and I'm just thrilled to have an opportunity to catch up with you and uh, divide up the world with you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. We'll uh, we'll pick it up where we left off in the uh, very near future. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. 